Delighted to welcome you and so pleased to have the chance to be with you tonight. What a very special evening it is. I think one thing that we're celebrating tonight is Frontiers of Science. And we have Professor Gibbs with us and his family. Professor Gibbs uh, was a chair in the Department of Physics and in 1967, he was the first Frontiers of Science presenter and was really instrumental in creating Frontiers of Science. Uh, maybe we could acknowledge him for a brilliant idea. We're very pleased that Dr. Gibbs could be with us and also some of his family members, Courtney Gibbs and Colin Gibbs here with us. Um, Dr. Gibbs was on our faculty for 36 years in the physics department and also um, was a chair, I think, for about seven years of that time. We're really grateful for the fact that you have maintained a connection with us in our college and that you had such a strong idea for the importance of conveying science to the public, both uh, scientists and others, uh, educated lay people, and the importance of helping us all understand uh, frontiers of science and the impact in society. So in its distinguished uh, history, Frontiers of Science has featured more than 270 diverse and distinguished scientists. Uh, in addition to nu numerous Nobel laureates, the list includes many members of the National Academies in Sciences, Engineering, and the Institute of Medicine, and the Royal Society of London, as well as Guggenheim and MacArthur Fellows. Quite a distinguished group of people that we have been able to host here at the University of Utah through this support and this creative idea. So thank you very, very much. Now it's my pleasure to make a couple of comments about biology and certainly about our featured speaker. This evening, we get to feature one of the world's most celebrated scientists, our very own Dr. Mario Capecchi. I've been fortunate to get to know Dr. Capecchi a little bit during my time at the U, and I can say that he is not only a tremendous scientist, he's a remarkable person and an outstanding ambassador for our university and for our state. Dr. Kopecki was recruited to Utah from Harvard in 1973 by Dr. Gordon Lark, the chair of the biology department at that time. Dr. Lark helped us transform biology in the 1970s by hiring several key faculty members. I'd have to say, I know Dr. Lark has many accomplishments as a distinguished biologist, but let's credit him for this one, most of all, recruiting Dr. Kopecki. Well done. <laughs> Dr. Lark is still very connected with us, and uh, his department is now called the School of Biological Sciences. I think um, I would like to just comment on that a little bit because it was such a visionary effort that our chair, Denise Deering, and colleagues in biology um, saw the appropriateness and the importance of staying connected as biologists in one entity. Um, I've seen many other institutions that divided biology into ever smaller units and departments, and I think that in so many ways we are stronger together as a school of biological sciences that has divisions that represent individual areas and individual strengths, but maintain the sense of the collective good and vision and connection among biologists. So congratulations, School of Biological Sciences, and please join me in welcoming our chair, Denise Deary. Well, thank you, Ruth, and thank you for your support of the School of Biological Sciences. <clears throat> so it's my great privilege and honor as director of the School of Biological Sciences to be able to introduce you to Dr. Mario Capecchi, Distinguished Professor of Biology and Human Genetics and Nobel Laureate. It's also a formidable task to take a few minutes to introduce Mario and do justice to all the fabulous work that he's done over the years. So I'm going to speak quickly, be brief, and forgive me, Mario, if I leave out any um, keynotes. And I've tried to include things that you can't find on Wikipedia. <laughs> so I'll start with Mario's academic history. He got his Bachelor's of Science in 1961 from Antioch College in Ohio. He then went on to study biophysics at Harvard University, where he became interested in molecular biology and joined the lab of Dr. James Watson. 
After his PhD with Dr. James Watson, he continued to ascend through the ranks at Harvard, first as a junior fellow in the Academy of Fellows from 1967 to 1969, then as assistant professor in 1969, followed, to promotion, followed by promotion to associate in 71. And it was at this time that the University of Utah entered into the picture with Mario when Gord Dr. Gordon Lark, who Ruth mentioned, um, was encouraged by a recent faculty hire, Dr. Larry Oaken, to pursue Mario at all costs, woo him away from Harvard University, where he had been for so long. Gordon respected, um, Gordon admired Mario's scientific approach to try to ask big questions to get big answers. Gordon respected and acknowledged that answering these significant questions could take years of focused efforts without rapid returns. He was successful in convincing Mario that Utah was exactly the place that he could pursue such monumental long-term questions. He recruited Mario to the University of Utah in 1973 as an associate professor where Mario has been ever since. So this is, this is something you can't read on Wikipedia. Two requirements of Mario's hire were that he was able to retain a very large walk-in freezer to do biochemistry, and also that he could have windows installed in the windowless building of South Biology so that he could see the beautiful Utah campus he was promised. Mario's groundbreaking, or rather wall-breaking efforts were very pioneering in this respect in that every hire that has since come into that building has requested windows in South Biology. <laughs> Why be in Utah if you can't see it? So Mario's spirit of innovation included more than just wall breaking. In the 1970s and 80s, Mario laid out a research program to develop the techniques to target specific genes in mammals in order to create mammals with mutations in desired genes to understand their function. His revolutionary work in this area was done in the building just behind you, South Biology. And at a suggestion of his colleague, Dr. Larry Oaken, we have created a display of some of the equipment that Mario used in his very early experiments to document that mammal cells were capable of doing a process known as homologous recombination. Mario, Mario had hoped to leverage this process, homologous recombination, in order to create genetically modified mammals. It was using this equipment that Mario conducted as many as a thousand tedious injections of DNA into cells each and every day while listening to Patsy Cline. And we haven't figured out what media he was listening to it on. He thinks it could have been vinyl, but it might have been cassette tapes. <laughs> and Homologous recombination is a process that we take for granted right now, and at that time, it was Mario's task to document to the world that this indeed happened in mammal cells. So um, Mario didn't want to keep this technology to himself, and he had a special suitcase built so that he could pack up this e equipment and travel around the country and world with it, teaching others how to do this technique. You can preview this display on, as you exit the auditorium. I should say it's still a little under construction. It, we hope to finish it soon, but um, it's on the way out of the auditorium. So as recognition of his innovative and game-changing work in biology, Mario has been recognized with every major award in science. His very first award came from the American Chemical Society in 1969 and was followed by many, many more. There are more than 50 awards on Mario's CV. Here's just a few of them. The Kyoto Prize, the Lasker Award, the National Medal of Science, membership in major national academies of science across the globe, and of course, <coughs> the Nobel in 2007 in physiology or medicine shared with doctors Oliver Smithies and Martin Evans. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mario Capecchi, who will discuss some of the ongoing work in his lab. Thank you. There was one more aspect about the seduction of coming to here, and that is a week-long, actually even a 10-day-long uh, hike through the Wind Rivers. 
that sealed it <laughs> with Larry and his family and our family. Okay. So it's a really a pleasure to be talking here. You know, as scientists, we often give lectures all over the world, but hardly ever do we talk at home. <laughs> and uh, so this is a really a pleasure to be able to talk at home. This is home. So let me begin. Uh, uh, first of all, I don't want to scare anybody, okay? And that is, it's going to be scientific. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what scientists do are, is actually not that complicated. We usually hide it in a jargon. And so if you strip it of the jargon, then actually what we do is pretty simple. And so bear with me. Uh, I hope at the end at least you'll get the punchline. <laughs> OK. So let's start. Boom. There's two ways of doing science, and all scientists do it both ways. That is serendipity, you fall into a pro particular project, and the other you design the project. In this particular case, it's serendipity. Uh, our lab has been working on, had been working on Hox genes for a very long time. And Hox genes are interesting because they're involved in making the body plans of all animals. They make sure our head is at this position, our arms are at this position, all the organs are at the position, appropriate position by making the analog for making those organs. You tie it all together and you have a functional human being. And what I'm showing you is, are the uh, Hox genes of two organisms, a Drosophila at the very top, a fruit fly, and uh, all mammals, that includes mouse and humans and everything in between. There are 39 Hox genes, and the nice thing about Hox genes is that its position on the chromosome tells you where it's functioning along the axis of the body. And remember that there, we have multiple axes. We have a major axis, we have minor axes, for example, in making the arm, distal, distal, proximal, <coughs> uh, vent uh, dorsal, ventral. Okay? So all of those different axes are then uh, ma uh, made, essentially, created by Hox genes. And it's a clever system of converting, essentially, time into space. And that's why the orientation of these genes are also important. Genes at this end of the complex are important at the anterior aspect of your body, and genes at the other end, at the posterior end. And remember that when you develop, you develop from an anterior to posterior direction. So space is being converted into time by simply reading it out from left to right. Okay? Is that right? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, we've inactivated all of these genes, and different graduate students and postdocs were assigned to different ones. And the one I'm going to be talking about is Hox B8, right here. And uh, among many other projects, Joy Greer was in charge of Hox B8. Uh, I should remind you that when we inactivate even one of these genes, even though there's quite a bit of redundancy, even in the heterozygote, that is only one mutant copy. Remember, you have two copies of every gene, one from your father, one from your mother. Even if you inactivate one, you still, with this particular set of genes, you still see a phenotype, uh, an effect of the mutation. Okay? So she inactivated Hoxby 8 and she looked at it, and it looked pretty normal. It was running around, didn't have any extra ribs, or extra hands or extra heads or anything, it looked quite normal. So she was a clever woman, so she decided to look at behavior. And mice mostly do their activity at nighttime, so she used an infrared camera and then simply took movies 24 hours at a shot. And then looked from frame to frame exactly what is this mouse doing. And she looked at every conceivable behavior. Okay, so here's an example. This one is eating. Okay? So the, there's two bars, a gray bar and a black bar. A gray bar is a sibling that's normal, has two good copies of the gene, Hoxby 8. 
And the, gray, and the black bar has two bad copies, two defective copies of uh, HOXB8. And they're also matched for sex. So a particular pair will be either male or female. So she looked at how much time spent uh, eating and then averaged them up. And what you see is eating wasn't affected by that HOXB8 mutation. So they're both spending equal amount of times when you average it over lots of people, uh, lots of mice uh, <coughs> over time, okay? So she looked at everything, running around the cage, walking, running, jumping, uh, drinking, eating, uh, scratching, grooming, you name it, building nests, you name it. And she looked at all of these, all of them were normal except for grooming. Okay. And what you can see is that uh, a mutant mouse spends almost twice as much time grooming as normal. Okay. So that was a, a phenotype. That's an effect of the mutation. Remember that these mice are inbred, okay, unfortunately for 30 generations or more. So all the genes are the same except this one gene that we've modified. So when we compare two um, mice, they are identical, okay? They're better than identical twins, <laughs> okay? Then, uh, so you see essentially uh, the same genetic background and grooming is affected, okay? We can also induce grooming. We can spray water on a mouse and that induces it to groom. And in this case, we actually bred our mutant mouse to real wild type mice out in the field, okay? Why did we do that? We wanted to see genetic background make any difference. And if you follow the genotype, the uh, two mutant copies of HOXB8, then you see twice as much time grooming. Okay? So genetic background does not appear to affect this behavior. Now here is a grooming pattern. And it's the same for all animals. Joseph seal against groom. And you might wonder, how does a seal against groom? Seal against groom? Uh, Drosophila groom, mice groom, and we groom. All animals groom. Okay? And here is the syntax, okay? the pattern. And you start at the head end, you go in the shower, you lather your hands, and start working on your head. And you start working down your body, and then if you had a tail, you'd end up with the tail. Okay? So the syntax is not affected by this mutation. Simply the number of bouts and the duration. So it, they're grooming longer, but the pattern is not affected. I told you a slight error. If you do too much over a 24 hour period, if you do too much of one thing, you have to take it away from something else. And what these mice are doing is not sleeping as much. Okay. I'm gonna show you a little movie just to show you that it is pathological. Hopefully. There we go. So what you'll see is this mouse grooms and grooms and grooms and grooms. Just relax. And then what you'll see when it turns, it's actually groomed so much that it's removing the body hair where it's accessible to it. What we call the ventral side or the tummy side. Okay. There, whoop, there, go. Can you see that? All the hair is gone. It's going to turn again. There. Okay? And further, it keeps on grooming until it actually has lacerations. So it is pathological. Okay. So at that point, we put them to sleep. So we have a, a, a phenotype. And further, I should say that it's very similar to a human a phenotype called trichotillomania. This is an OCD obsessive compulsive disorder uh, uh, related to that particular behavior where you have a behavior that just keeps on going and going and going. You can't stop. You don't have any gratification, for example. They wash their hands all the time. And then uh, rather than stopping and say, my hands are clean, they still feel they're dirty. They continue to walk until they act wash until they actually have lacerations. Okay? So it is pathological. And this behavior is very, very similar to that human pathology. Okay, so uh, the next person to work on this project was Sha Quan Chen. 
And he didn't like to take movies, and he didn't like to look at frame by frame. So what we did was to switch to platforms. They're extremely sensitive to vibration. Now, if you're walking, you give out one vibration. If you're running, you give out a different vibration. If you're standing still, different vibration. Sleeping, breathing, uh, drinking, eating. Everything you do has a different vibration pattern. And then you can have an algorithm that simply converts that vibration pattern into behavior. Okay? And we can use films to verify that, and it works. And it's extremely robust. Now, this is data of about 50 mice rather than just a couple of mice, and again, uh, <coughs> mutant mice spend twice as much time grooming. Very robust, very reproducible. Okay. Now, this was an unexpected result. We put a normal mouse in the same cage as a mutant mouse, and it grooms it. But the pattern is opposite. Now, instead of removing the body hair on the ventral side, which isn't accessible to it, it grooms the other mouse on the back. Okay, and removes its body here. Now, this was an important clue because what it meant is it's not likely to feel an itch on another mouse. Okay, so that said CNS, the brain. Okay. And indeed, the brain is responsible for be grooming behavior. And people have done this very crudely by just snipping out little parts of the brain and seeing whether the behavior is affected. And that's true all in all mammals except humans, it hasn't been tried. <laughs> I hope. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now, there was a problem, okay? And that was that in uh, mice, uh, we tried to look for be, uh, expression of the gene, function of the gene in the brain. If the brain's responsible, then Hox B8 should be expressed in the brain, okay? And we looked for it, and we couldn't find it. Okay, and so that said, well, maybe the level of expression is low, and we just, our technology isn't good enough. But what we do as a geneticist is simply engineer the mouse so we can take a gene from a jellyfish that fluoresces green, put it in the middle of a gene, wherever that gene functions, then those cells will turn green. Okay? And that's what's shown here. Uh, what we have, and it's a system called Cree locks. Whoops, sorry. Hmm? What happened? All right, I'll just describe it. This is a little hairy, but not too bad, okay? Okay, so uh, we have essentially a GFP. It's a, a, a gene that encodes a green fluorescent protein, okay? And then we put in front of it a stop sign. Normally associated with any gene, there's a small cassette that is a computer that says, be expressed here, be expressed there, do not be expressed over there, okay? It controls essentially the, uh, where this gene functions throughout the body, throughout development, uh, and all t uh, time periods, okay? So it's controlling space and time for that particular gene, okay? So we put, uh, we put this gene, uh, GFP, into a locus that's expressed in every cell of the body but we put a stop sign in front of it, so it's not functioning. Okay, so now it's expressed in no tissues of the cell. But next to the stop sign, we put what I call Cree Lox, uh, Lox P sites, which are 35 base pairs uh, in repeat, and there's an enzyme that mediates uh, recombination just at those 34 base pairs. If you have two of them together, and you have them in the same direction, and you do the topology, what happens is it excises that stop sign when the enzyme is present. So by controlling where that enzyme is present, we can excise the gene just in those cells, or excise the stop sign and just in those cells, and those cells will turn green. Now, where do we have Cree being made? Wherever HoxB8 is functioning. So wherever HoxB8 is functioning, that marker is turned on, and then those cells will stay green forever. It's a cell lineage marker. It's not telling us that the gene is expressed, but simply that it's expressed at some point of time. And then all the cells and all the progeny of those cells will stay green forever. And that allows us then to follow in the brain, for example, where are the green cells 
those are the cells that at one time expressed HOXB8. Okay, is that clear? So HOXB8 controls Cre, and therefore Cre excises a stop sign wherever HOXB8 is functioning at a particular time. Okay, so and we did that experiment, and we got an enormous surprise. Now, most of us think about brains, and we think about neurons, okay? Neurons weren't green. No neurons were green. The only green cells in the brain were microglia. Microglia are actually from the immune system. They're made, and for example, a lot of, um, I'll go back, I'll actually bore you to death as to how my, uh, the blood system makes uh, <coughs> Uh, all of the cells are responsible for hemopoiesis uh, because it's important to the story. But what we see are green cells, so those expressed at one time, HOXB8. Uh, the next panel shows red color in a marker for all microglia, and, and, those, and that marker then turns red, so we can see all microglia. And then the final panel is merged, and you can see red and gre uh, green and red make yellow, and so then you'll see yellow cells. Okay? You'll see two things. One is that uh, microglia are present, but not all microglia. Only about 20 to 25 to 30 percent of microglia uh, at one point expressed HOXB8. Okay? But those are the only green cells in the whole brain. That's it. So what I'm telling you is that microglia, immune cells of the brain, are controlling neural circuits. Okay? You can imagine how many neurobiologists believe that. <laughs> so we had to do a lot of homework. Here we're doing just change the color and then use two photon microscopy in a live animal where we can really see the microglia and they certainly look like microglia. And they also sort of look like neurons, okay? You have a cell body and lots of things sticking out from this and waving out in space. Interesting cells. Okay, so I'll just repeat that. Microglia are immune cells in the brain. They're derived from hemopoiesis and function normally as macrophages. For example, if you get a bacterial infection or a, a viral infection or you have stroke, then microglia clean up the mess. Okay? That's their normal role. This is what everybody thought microglia were all about. But we're suggesting a different role. We're suggesting that microglia are controlling very specific circuits that give rise to very specific behavior, that is, removal of body hair. Okay? So this made a very strong prediction. Since uh, my, microglia are hemopoietic cells, we should be able to cure the mouse with a, a bone marrow transplant. Okay? You destroy all the bone marrow in the mouse with radiation and then give it new bone marrow and that should rescue the phenotype if the bone marrow that we put in is not mutant, okay? So that's the prediction. Sha Kwan said, what? I said, do a bone marrow transplant in a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> he said, all right, and, and he did. First of all, he's, first of all, you wanted to know, can you get green cells in the, in the brain at all if we use hemopoietic cells and label them green? Okay? So simply taking uh, from a mouse uh, uh, ones that are labeled with GFP, the hemopoietic, all hemopoietic cells are labeled, we stick it in the tail vein, and then ask do they arrive in the mouse at an appropriate time, and the answer is yes, we see green cells in the brain. We're getting pretty good transfer, transplantation, about 70%. So here's the actual experiment. Here is a mutant mouse at about three weeks uh, after uh, uh, birth. Okay, we're doing the experiments about three weeks after birth. Uh, and then actually, I'm sorry, this should be six weeks after birth. Uh, we injected the bone marrow, so we radiated to, and, and lethally radiated. So if the bone marrow doesn't work, the mouse dies, okay? So if the mouse is alive, then we know that the experiment is working. Okay? And uh, three weeks after uh, injection, what you can see, it's removed all the body hair. If I showed you the same slide a week later, you'd see lots of lacerations. But then if we look 
uh, three months later, all the lacerations are healed, all the hair has grown back, and then if we look actually at the behavior over here, here's mutant, here's wild type, here's mutant, and then it's gone back, the one that's rescued with the bone marrow transplant has gone back to normal uh, amount of, of grooming behavior, okay? And no longer removing its body hair. This mouse is permanently cured of that behavioral uh, this, uh, <coughs> this, uh, disease. Okay. So, we can do the opposite. We can put mutant bone marrow in a normal mouse and give it the pathology. Okay, so that says it's both necessary and sufficient. Okay. So, further, these experiments further suggested that indeed uh, microglia are responsible for this phenotype, but not to the reviewers. Okay. <laughs> they were still skeptical. So, so, why are they skeptical? Oops, I'll, I'll take you through one reason they might be skeptical because it is an important reason, but then I'll give you their reason for being skeptical. Okay, HoxB8, Hox, all Hox genes do lots of things. They're responsible for everything in a particular region of your body, and there's lots of things in a particular region, okay? So, uh, one of the things that HoxB8 does is control uh, sensitivity to pain and noxious agents, nociception. And in fact, uh, this was known, and a group in Belgium said, well, our, our, our observations could be answered simply by that property. They're no longer now sensitive to pain, and therefore they start to scratch and do all sorts of bad things, and therefore have that pathology. So we had to address that issue. Okay, first of all, what is the issue? Okay. Here we're looking at the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord. If you don't remember, your spinal cord is here. We're simply cutting across there and then looking at that slice at that particular point. And we've labeled uh, uh, two things. We've labeled the sensory neurons coming from the outside going into the, the spinal cord, and that's with CGRP. And then with Carl Biden, Carl Retinen actually labels the interneurons that those sensory neurons contact. Okay, so what you can see at the top is a nice layer, layers of C, CGRP, calbindin, and calretinin, and they form nice clean layer. Okay, in the mutant, what you see is there are a lot fewer cells, and they're disorganized. They're sort of more scattered. Okay, so that mutation hoxb 8 affects making the interneurons that are responsible for getting sensory inputs. Okay. Now, uh, the other way we can test this is simply by putting a mouse on a hot plate. And it's not really hot, okay? It's a little uncomfortable. So they jump. And we can measure how quickly they react, okay? And so a normal mouse takes about 25 seconds to react, and our mutant mice take about uh, three times longer. Two, two and a half times longer, okay? So that's, a e again, an easy quantifiable measurement of it, that insensitivity to heat in this case. Okay. Now the first indication that we could actually separate those two properties about HoxB8 uh, was in the actual bone marrow transplant itself. Okay. That's shown here. So in the mutant, okay, remember that the bone marrow completely abolished over grooming and got rid of all the lacerations and everything, okay? That mouse was cured of that behavior. And what we can see in the wild type mouse, uh, that level of insensitivity, the mutant mouse, HoxB8 mutant mouse, has uh, less, is less sensitive to pain, but the rescued mouse doesn't show any change, okay? It's identical to the mutant. So we haven't rescued its ability to be insensitive to pain by the bone marrow transplant, even though we completely rescued the behavioral phenotype. Okay, removal of body hair. So that indicated maybe those two properties are a part of HoxB8, but they're separable genetically. Okay? And the way to do that is just do it conditionally. Inactivate the gene, not in every cell of the mouse, but only in particular sectors of the mouse. The bone marrow, we can inactivate there and ask what happens. And we can inactivate it in the spinal cord and ask what happens. 
So, in, for the bone marrow, we use type 2 Cre because that's expressed in hemopoietic stem cells. So all hemopoietic cells will have type 2 Cre. First of all, we can ask, uh, does type 2 Cre make green cells if we use our reporter system with GFP? And the answer is yes in the brain. So that says the experiment may work. And here's the actual experiment. Okay, so here we're just inactivating it in the bone marrow. We see hair removal. We see twice as much grooming pattern, but we do not affect insensitivity to pain. Okay, so if we inactivate in the bone marrow, we get reflection of the bone marrow phenotype, but do not affect insensitivity to pain. We can also look at the spinal cord and see the same thing. That is, here's the wild type pattern, the mutant pattern in the middle, and then the type 2 Cre, conditional mutant, and what we see is the pattern is wild type. Okay? Compare this to this as opposed to that. So that says, again, by that criteria, we've separated those, that phenotype. Okay? We can do the opposite. We can inactivate it just in, uh, in the spinal cord. And in that case, we used HOXC8 because HOXC8 is a member of that same family as HOXB8. And in the spinal cord, it's expressed just like HOXB8, but it's not expressed in the brain, in microglia. Okay? So we can use that to inactivate HOXB8 and ask what happens under those conditions. And the experiment shown in this slide, no removal of body hair, no effect in time span grooming, but recapitulate completely the insensitivity to pain. Okay. So that is that by that criteria, we sept they both are responsible, HOXB is responsible for both, but they are separable, okay, genetically. Okay. Boom. And if we look at the spinal cord, now we recapitulate the, uh, mut the mutant pattern, this pattern and this pattern, as opposed to this pattern where you have nice, uh, tight uh, laminar structure. Okay. So, the next problem we had is source of microglia. Why am I taking you through all of this? And the reason is because they took us through all of this. <laughs> you su I suffered, you have to suffer. <laughs> okay. The source of microglia, it's, if you look at any, any bo uh, literature, even up to today, uh, you read it, there's a single source of microglia. It has become dogma. It's only dogma since 1912, uh, I mean, yeah, no, 2012, <laughs> 2012, but now it is dogma. And, er and what makes it dogma is that every review article that's ever written then makes the same statement. There's only a single cell source of microglia, and that's shown in the next slide, Whoop. and that's this paper. And it's a beautiful paper, actually. It does, essentially what it does is use the Crelock system that I just talked about, but to do cell lineage of microglia. Okay? And what they found was they only found microglia being born in the yolk sac, and then directly at E7 and a half days of gestation. Remember, a mouse gestation isn't nine months, only three weeks. <laughs> Lucky mouse. And, and then, uh, so, here we have, uh, you have the essentially made in the yolk sac. Remember, I'll go through this uh, over and over again. Hemopoiesis is very complicated. It starts at one place, yolk sac, then AGM, and then <coughs> fetal liver, and then finally bone marrow. And then there are also other sources. For example, the placenta also has bone, makes uh, blood cells and so on. So, there are many different sites, and it follows a progression, essentially, from site to site uh, as you go through embryogenesis. Okay. And they uh, argued, essentially, that all microglia are born very early in, in yolk sac hemopoiesis. Yolk sac hemopoiesis is about uh, e seven and a half days of gestation to about 12 and a half days of gestation. Okay, and then the AGM starts taking over a little before that, and then the fetal liver takes over a little after that, and so on, okay? <clears throat> and this is their model. So here is the placenta, the embryo, the yolk sac, their blood islands in the yolk sac, and then those cells are born, 
and then they directly migrate, the progenitor cells are born in the yolk sac and directly migrate into the brain, and then at about e nine and a half days gestation, they go essentially from outside the brain into the brain and become microglia. Okay, that's their model. Now, what we knew is that there are at least, we think that there are two, at least two microglial populations, ones that express HOXB8 and the ones that don't express HOXB8. Okay? So there's at least that division, and the question is, do they have different sources? And if they have different sources, then that means that they might be different functionally. Okay? That's why this is important biologically uh, and why we were driven to do a lot of experiments. Okay. So in order to do that, we made two colored mice. Okay. One of them uh, <coughs> is uh, CX3CR1, GFP. So GFP is now fused to that gene. So wherever that gene is expressed, those cells will turn green. And that labels all microglia, all microglia. Okay. And then we made red ones by doing the same trick that I've just said is that we have a sensory reporter. In this case, instead of being green, it's red, TD tomato. And then we put it under control of Hox genes, of a Cre, put Cre under the control of Hox genes. And therefore, wherever Hox is expressed, then those uh, reporters are turned on and turned on as cell lineage markers. Okay? So that allows us, and again, what you can see is green ones, everybody's green and the subpopulation is red, and here is coincidence, then these are the yellow ones, which are the, uh, uh, the ones that are both red and green. Okay? And again, it's about 30% in the brain. Okay. So the first thing on this, oh, that's, ah, that's the slide of way back when. Forget about that. That's Crelox. <laughs> it jumped. That's cute. Okay. So the first thing we did was simply to ask, uh, when do yellow cells arrive in the brain? When do you first see yellow cells in the brain? Okay, remember that green cells get in there at nine and a half days of gestation. And so we don't see any yellow cells until 12 and a half days of gestation. Three days later, which in 19 days is a long period of time for a mouse, okay, because total gestation is 19 days. Okay. So, and so that's what this shows, and we start seeing yellow cells, not many at 12 and a half, but they slowly build up and then reach a steady state, and P0 means birth, and then so P8, we pretty much have steady state at 30%. Okay? So that's when yellow cells first appear in the brain. This could be explained by two hypotheses. One is that a subpopulation of green cells turn on HOXB8 and become yellow because they're also now red. That's one possibility. The other is that there's a different population that gets into the brain at 12 and a half days of gestation that was, uh, that was essentially coming from somewhere else. And in particular, in, a, you know, uh, <coughs> in the yolk sac, it's extra embryonic, but then all the later stages are embryonic sources, so they could be coming from those states. Okay. And an easier way to distinguish that, simply to ask, when is HOXB8 actually expressed? Okay, remember I told you that the red isn't telling you where messenger RNA is made, it simply tells you that that gene was turned on at some point. Okay? And then those cells will stay uh, green or red, whatever we want, forever. Okay? Cell lineage. So we look at the actual RNA, and you can do this by uh, a a technology called PCR, and what we can see is we see high expression in the yolk sac, then we see lower expression in the, uh, in the AGM, the next stage of uh, hemopoiesis, in fetal liver barely detectable, but nothing ever in the brain, nothing in the brain, way below one transcript per cell, okay? way below that. Okay? So what does, that rules out the first hypothesis that a subpopulation of green cells turned on HOXB8 and therefore then became red and, and, and then green because they, I mean yellow because a combination of both red and green. Okay, so we've ruled out that hypothesis. They've got to come from somewhere else. Okay, so, uh, so now we're talking about the new group of people. Uh, and I'll, I'll actually show you pictures of those people so you'll get to know them. Uh, 
and uh, at the very end, uh, and they're even in the audience. That's terrific. Okay. So, hemopoiesis. I've already mentioned that it is complicated and it goes to, through many steps. So here is actually a uh, fact sorting of those cells. So we're fact sorting for DG tomato, okay, so ones that have expressed HOXB8 at some point. And then we also fax for progenitor cells with CKIT. Okay, and that's uh, true for all hemopoietic uh, cells, progenitor cells, they would express CKIT. And then, and then we look and see. And we look in the yolk sac and we see a few yellow cells, okay, and uh, about 3%. Then in AGM, all of a sudden, you see a lot of yellow cells, okay? The expansion relative to yolk sac is 16-fold, about four cell doublings. And then you go to the fetal liver, and now there's a huge expansion, 282-fold, okay? About eight cell doublings, okay? So what you see is that the cells are born in the yolk sac, but appear to then go to the AGM, and then fetal liver, and then finally go to the brain. Okay. Here we're looking at that uh, just as quantitation as amount of time, and you can see that about 3% in the yolk sac, uh, and it starts very uh, fairly early, uh, uh, about E8.5. We can't see it at E7.5, when uh, yolk sac hemopoiesis starts. There we can't see transcripts, but you can at E8.5, and then it builds up, but then you see an enormous expansion in the AGM, going almost to 100%, and then again, a, a slight delay relative to the AGM, and then a huge expansion in the fetal liver. Okay. okay. So, as I've just mentioned, there are two waves in yolk sacs. There's a first wave where all, that's when the green ones get in, okay? And then there's a second wave, and there's controversy about the second wave now in the literature itself. Uh, we didn't make it, but other people have made it. And roughly the controversy is simply how complicated is that second phase? How many different progenitors? There's one camp that says there are many different progenitors. There's another camp that says there's a main uh, progenitor population, uh, <coughs> fetal hemopoietic stem cells. Okay. So that's what this says. Okay, and here, now the fetal population is defined by a marker called SCA1. Okay, that's, and that's been used forever for hemopoietic stem cells. And so what we wanted to know is, are, are, do our progenitors also express SCA1? So we sorted with respect to SCA1 and, then, uh, and the other markers, and then uh, we see again that the Pattern looks similar to the previous one I showed you, but they're actually more represented in this population than there were in the other population where we weren't looking at SCA1 subpopulation. Okay. And then we can look at all uh, hemopoietic stem cells, and they have our marker. But again, they don't show any transcripts, so that had been, t the HOXB8 had to be turned on during fetal uh, hemopoietic stem cell progenitors state, okay? because there's nothing in uh, bone marrow uh, f <coughs> stem cells. Okay, so here's our model based on what I've just talked about. The, uh, what we call canonical microglia, which comprise about 70% of all microglia, are born in the yolk sac and directly go into the brain, whereas the second population is labeled also with HOXB8, Goes, starts in the fetal liver, I mean, the yolk sac, goes to the AGM, goes to the fetal liver, and then at each point gets amplified, and then finally ends up in the brain at a later stage. Okay, so, and, okay, and this simply says, because now we have a new ontology, those cells are likely to be different. That is, if you're going through a bunch of different tissues, you're likely to get signals from those tissues and, 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 and have a history, essentially, of that pathway, and therefore different from what people would call canonical microglia. Okay. So now, <coughs> what we want to do is simply say, well, if we have two populations, how similar and how dissimilar are they? Okay. And the first thing one does is simply look at RNA transcript how many genes 
function in those particular cells. And I don't, you can't see it, but there's a haze essentially uh, of gray right along one, okay? That means we're comparing the two populations. We sorted out green ones, we sorted out red ones, and then simply looked at every RNA that's present in those two populations and what's different, okay? And so 30,000 genes are the same. Uh, 21 genes are different, okay? So there's two things in from that lesson. One is that they're very similar and look like microglia and have the same genes as microglia, but with slight differences. And those 21 genes are interesting, and we're pursuing those genes. Okay. So <clears throat> that's what that says. So there are two markers that other labs have identified as being very specific for microglia. And one's called TMEM119, and the other one's called SAL1. Okay. And this defines microglia according to the dogma. So we had just looked at RNA transcripts, so we asked, well, do the red ones and green ones uh, also express TMEM119 and SAL1? And the answer is they do, and they express it at the same high level, okay? Identical, okay? So that says, by this criteria, not ours, but their criteria, these are bona fide parenchymal microglia, okay? But since one is red, and you can see them, you can ask how many of the red ones also express TMEM? And it's greater than 98%. So that says by that criteria, most of the cells that are red cells in the brain have to be microglia, parenchymal microglia. Okay. So now, having shown that we, our Hox B8 microglia look like and behave like and have the same genes as uh, microglia, then maybe uh, uh, we can actually prove that the progenitor cells are actually cap capable of giving rise to parenchymal mic microglia. And this uh, experiments of Don and Schrudo, which I'll show you later. And it's a simple experiment, not very simple, but it's th theoretically simple. And that is simply to f take fetal liver we're not doing anything about yolk sac, okay? We're looking at fetal liver progenitor cells, okay? DD tomato positive, CKIP positive, and then isolate them, sort them out in a pure population, and then put them back into the brain of a normal wild type mouse, okay? But they're labeled with TD tomato, okay? We've made them red. So they're easy to see in the brain, and if we see any red cells, the only place they could have come from is the transplantation experiment. Okay? There's no other place they could be coming from. And we can further ask, do they then express TMEM119? And that says that the progenitor cells that we're injecting became microglia, uh, mature microglia. Okay? So here's the experiment. Uh, we only sort it for red, but we also then look to see whether they're green because all microglia should be green. And indeed, they are green. They express TMEM19, and, and then they co-localize, essentially, with respect to those markers. And you also see cells that, aren't, that are TMEM positive, TMEM119 positive, but aren't red or green, okay? Because they should be, because they're microglia in the brain that we're injecting into, okay? Okay. Further, we can actually do the experiment so that a large percentage of the population is from the transplantation. Uh, if you don't, and, that, and the way we do that is just genetically kill all microglia in the brain because they're responsible. They're looking at these new cells coming in and they kill most of them. And that makes, the, it, it, uh, makes it inefficient. But if we kill those microglia, then uh, the new population simply divides and it, it populates the whole brain and therefore uh, gets many, many thousands upon thousands of microglia there. Okay, so how are we doing? <coughs> oh, okay, I'll go really fast now. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're now asking, the, uh, the next question is, do they behave like microglia? So one of the things that microglia do is if there's damage, and you can use a laser that you focus within the brain in a live mouse, and where we can look, use two photon microscopy to see the microglia, we can do damage at a single cell, the neuron, in the middle of the brain, 
And then the microglia, there's red ones and green ones right next to each other, will do make the uh, an incision right by laser right in the middle. You'll see that. Okay, let's do it. Bam, there's the damage. And there, now they're sending out the philopodia to the damaged site, and the yellow ones and green ones get there exactly at the same time. Watch again. Bam. Okay. This is uh, speeded up. This is, it normally takes about 25 minutes, uh, and we just speeded it up so you could see it. So by that criteria, they're identical. Okay. So they're not only look like, they uh, behave like, and now, uh, now behave like microglia. We can do another experiment. Uh, remember, I can't just stick a needle into the brain because all the microglia will go to the needle. Okay, you're doing damage. Okay. But what you can do is cut a facial nerve. Okay, cut on one side. You're symmetric, so you have facial nerves on both sides of your brain. And then they go back into the brain, which is in the hindbrain, and then they make connections. Uh, and then that's where the cell bodies are. So if we cut the nerve, then the cell bodies die. Okay, so that's what you can see here. So this side we didn't cut. This side we cut, and you see all these green and red microglia going to that, your yellow microglia going to that site because there's damage there to try to correct that damage. And on the other side is the control, okay? In this assay, yellow ones are actually a little better than green ones, okay? Just a little, but no, uh, uh, measurable uh, differences. So here we have similar, but a uh, little better. Another thing that microglia do is prune. Okay. You make twice as many neurons as you normally need. And <clears throat> so what happens is uh, uh, the body keeps track of which are good connections and which are bad connections. And then the, the system, microglia, go there and remove the bad connections. And so, and there, thereby reinforcing the good connections. I'm not shown. Next slide. So here is what we do is inject dye into the eye. It travels back to the thalamus, and there's where the connections are. Right there, bam. And then here is a microglia, and you can look at a green one and a yellow one. You can see little spots, and that's a dye that's associated with a synapse. So that's pruning, and it's activity dependent. And what we can see is these microglia are identical in pruning. Okay. Why, where are they different? They're different than where they are in the brain. These aren't simply randomly located in the brain, but what you can see, what we're, this, all this red is coming from the spinal cord. Remember I told you there's a lot of connections with the spinal cord in terms of inner neurons. But what I'm interested in is actual microglia, which is in here, and I don't know if you can see that, green ones and red ones, so we can count in any particular area how many red ones and how many green ones are there. And what you can see is there's high levels here and low levels in the rest of the brain. What is this region? It's the OCD circuit, in defined in humans by, uh, you know, by fMRI. They simply look at patients, and they, they're overly active in uh, people with OCD and trichotillomania, and they're normal in normals. And even if a pe person is receptive to certain drug treatments, then if it's working, then the level of activity is lowered. Okay, so we've done that. What have I done here? Whoops, boom. Oh. oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. So this is the OCD circuit, and that's, here's the OCD circuit, and somehow now microglia are controlling that circuit. And that is where the interesting question is. Okay, how do microglia control neural circuits? And that is, I'm looking for people to come in my lab and work out that, uh, <coughs> mechanism, because remember, you, you know almost nothing about any neuropsychiatric disorder. The only thing you know is if you give them certain pills, they go to sleep and then they don't bother you. Okay? <laughs> That's the level of sophistication. Okay. So here is a circuit, and here we have some microglia, and they have to be talking to each other. The first thing we want to establish is how do they talk to each other. And there's technology out there beautiful technology to tell you that, and that's uh, optogenetics, okay? These are, it's a, a beautiful story where essentially taking uh, 
bacteria that live in the ocean, okay, and their active, their channels, their sodium channels, their chloride channels, you name it, uh, and they're activated by light, okay. And they, uh, you turn on light, the pump sodium, for example, activate that neuron and make it fire. Or you can turn on chloride and you can put the, the, the neuron to sleep. Okay. And it's the uh, on off is milliseconds. So that means you can have frequency. Okay. So then we can do that to neurons and ask, do the microglia respond in the same frequency? Now they've got to be talking, they've got a language. Okay. And then we can, once we know they have a language, then we can establish that language. So I think we're very close to working out how these things are happening. And so how, that's what I sent you saying here, that uh, what we, in summary, what we've shown is that uh, these microglia, I think, are responsible for this phenotype, and it will be of interest to determine how and why. So I think I'll stop here and open it up for questions. Thank you. First Thanks. of all, I want to thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thanks, Mario. I'll run the microphone around so that everyone can hear the question. And the wilder, the better. Don't, don't be <laughs> shy. Do, micro, do microglia do any kind of phagocytosis in yes. that traditional sense? So they're doing that as well as what you're describing. That's right. And, uh, <clears throat> and we're just in the process now of determining, uh, they do several things. I mean, one is I didn't mention is that they actually, those projections are always waving out in space. And they're always waving, 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 waving. And then all of a sudden they stop. And then they stay there for about five to 10 minutes. What are they doing that time? They actually encapsulating a synapse. They're going right around it. The membranes are, right, you know, you look at the EM and they're right there. And the, that's a lot of work. And the question is, why are they doing it? Can they be, be through that process, be modulating the activity across that synapse? Okay. So there are many possibilities of, in terms of mechanisms. Uh, so, but uh, I think the tools are there to actually find out. Yes. Does anyone have a mic? Hi. I have a question um, regarding degenerative brain diseases. Uh -huh. Is there any relationship um, with microglia and degenerative brain degenerative brain diseases such as Alzheimer's? Yeah, uh, good question. And the answer is sort of mixed. And it's an interesting, uh, some people say they help, and other people say they hurt. They have opposite results. The, the data is the same, but the interpretations are different. Uh, and, and what they're helping with is getting rid of plaques, okay? And so the question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And people don't ha really have an answer to that yet, and so they don't know whether they're helping or hurting, uh, but they're certainly involved. And one has to, you know, and you know, in, with the immunology system, we have to be open to both possibilities, and they're likely to be both possibilities. The immune system does fantastic things. It gets rid of all sorts of pathogens, okay? But it also leads to inflammation, and, lead, and that can lead to cancer and all sorts of bad things. Okay. So there's always a yin and a yang, and I think the same thing will be true with respect to Alzheimer's. There'll be a period that may be doing good things, and then if it does too much, then it may become a bad thing. Um, I'm sure it's occurred to you that the OCD grooming behavior in the mice is kind of like a behavior of a whole body immune kind of response, like dealing with uh -huh. a pathogen or a parasite. So can you speculate on the connection between microglia and kind of a behavioral immune reaction. Right, no, I mean, I, I think there, the, the, there is a, you know, there's, there's now a whole field essentially of, of immune uh, neurobiology, uh, where essentially what, that's what they're looking at. But, you know, but the, previously they were always looking at uh, the inflammation aspect of it and the phagocytic uh, aspect of it. And now what I'm saying is it's probably much more sophisticated in the, the sense that it's affecting uh, behavior. Uh, the part that I didn't show you is that I don't believe that everything I've told you is actually correct. <laughs> okay, having told you that, why? And the answer is, it's too much machinery for one thing. Okay, I think it's actually much deeper than that. 
It's actually going to be involved in many neuropsychiatric disorders, and the output is going to be different depending on your genetic and environmental uh, history. Uh, so at sometimes it'll be OCD, at other times it'll be uh, <coughs> bipolar uh, depression, and other times it'll be you know, schizophrenia, and so on. And that it's the way it's going through is actually anxiety. And that the, what this system is really looking at is modulating anxiety and controlling anxiety, and when that goes awry, then you have a lot of problems. And then it is a, an immune reaction gone haywire. Um, yes? If you uh, either uh, kill all microglia, yeah. or better yet, conditionally block the function of all microglia in an adult a mouse, mm -hmm. what's the phenotype? Uh -huh. Good question, tough experiment. <laughs> and the reason it's tough is that what happens is you kill microglia and they don't die. <laughs> they disappear and then come back. The killing isn't 100%. And then the ones that are there, it has a sensory system saying we have you know, all of a sudden, oh my God, 99% of the microglia are going, divide like hell, okay, and they do. And they divide and divide and they come back before you can have any behavior. Okay. So how do you do your transplant then? You have to uh -huh. kill all the... Uh -huh. Now there, the transplant is very clever, okay? We kill and then put them back. Uh-huh. Okay, so... Then no more dividing of what's still there. Space is occupied. Go home. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In any studies with um, familial sort of uh, behavioral problems mm -hmm. that are very strong, have in any of these studies been linked to genes in the Hox cluster? Aha, uh -huh. good question. And uh, we're working on that. And, oops, you know what I didn't show? Damn. What? <laughs> the people that did the work. <laughs> Come on, go, 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 go. Ha! That's the old crew, and here's the new crew, okay? Uh, Simon, Ann, Shrudo, and Don, okay? Uh, the graduate students, the latter two did most of the work okay, of what I've talked about. And then these guys made sure that the work, that work was done correctly. <laughs> They're the uh, sticklers. Okay? It's, you, know, you, you either have to be yourself's worst enemy and really be rigorous against whatever you're doing, or you have to have somebody else do it, and therefore, uh, <clears throat> and that's what uh, uh, Simon and Anne are doing. But Anne is also ask, uh, concerned with that particular question, and that is what's happening in humans. Okay? And it turns out that there is a polymorphism. It's very high, high, 30% of people. In fact, the first, I won't say who it was, there's some guy that was working on Drosophila sequencing and then went to humans and all that kind of stuff. His DNA became Everybody's DNA, <laughs> okay? But this particular gene was flipped. <laughs> what was considered normal was mutant, okay? That's an interesting story, okay? <clears throat> uh, but anyway, so uh, there is a polymorphism that is expressed high levels, and it uh, seems to be tracking with the mutation, okay? So we're interested in that uh, uh, mutation and making mice that have exactly that change in, uh, and see what happens. And that's Anne's story. Next. Yes. The correlation between body position and gene position on the chromosomes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Beautiful story. D8 is in a strange place. How do, how yeah, do you right explain D8? What? How do you explain B8 having these effects? Uh -huh. They, they, the reason it has an effect, it's also involved in hemopoiesis. But coordinates for hemopoiesis are changing. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, so the, it's everywhere. 
And so it, it, it's not playing those rules. And so, uh, you know, there's a huge story on how Hox genes are controlling hemopoiesis, but nobody's worked it out because they don't know which uh, genes to cross because you've lost the spatiality. Okay, and so uh, they, they control hemopoiesis and therefore that's what we're seeing. And they're actually involved in making the decision, essentially, do you become a lymphoid cell or a myeloid cell? That's, that's their real role, the big role uh, in doing hemopoiesis. It's then, uh, and, and since the only myeloid cells in the brain are microglia, then those are affected. One more question? So if microglia fail to perform their pruning function, are there excess neurons that contribute to overactivity in the brain, or mm -hmm. does our body deal with those neurons in a different way? No, there, there, are, too <coughs> there are too many connections, and, and that has a pathology. And there's also other damage, that, and we're interested in that. Uh, I mean, there are lots of stories here, because it's, you know, uh, some of the stories are that you know, you're using drugs that you have no idea how they work. Flux, well, I was going to show you how floxidine works in humans, but they have no idea what they're doing in humans. But in mice, we can figure out what floxidine is doing in, in mice, okay? Because we can do genetics, we can look at many different stages and so on and so forth. So I think there's now all of a sudden, because of this pathology, we have an inroad into a lot of questions. Well, let's thank Mario for. <laughs> for sharing his ideas on this novel role of microglia in 20 years from now, just like homologous recombination. This novel role may be something that we take for granted. So this is Science in Action, and I hope you appreciate hearing how it marches along. Um, before we depart, I just want to bring to your attention some upcoming events in the College of Science. So. Um, the next Frontiers of Science is January 24th, and it will be given by Dr. Turi Serling. Did I get that wrong? Okay. And it's titled Ivory, Isotopes, and Interpol, A Detective Story. And I'd like to bring your attention to the Crimson Laureate Society. It's a new group dedicated to promoting and advancing science and mathematics at the University of Utah. And you can find out more about the Crimson Laureate Society on the College of Science website. Um, you can find all the events in the College of Science on their website and the events in the School of Biological Sciences on the School of Biological Sciences website. And we will be having more events this year to celebrate our opening of the new school. So thank you again for your attention, and I hope to see you at a future event.